Do you wonder if others are dealing with the same project management challenges as you? Not sure where to turn for guidance and leadership? Office Hours are in session as we discuss project management and PMOs with global leaders, hearing their story and learning their secrets to success. Our goal is to empower you and help you elevate your PMO and project management career to new heights. Welcome back to Project Management Office Hours with your host, PMO Joe. Welcome, everyone, to Project Management Office Hours. We're the number one live project management radio show in the U.S., broadcasting to you from the Phoenix Business Radio X studios in Tempe, Arizona, and my home in Gilbert, Arizona, and Vietnam, halfway around the world. I'm your host, PMO Joe, and for the next hour or so, we're going to be talking project management and a bunch of related topics with our special guest. Before we jump in uh, to the show, just wanted to mention a couple of items. Uh, Extremely honored and humbled once again uh, this year, the PMO Global Alliance has named me one of the top 15 PMO influencers in the world, and that's an incredible honor. The PMO Global Alliance does a great job recognizing PMO leaders, uh, PMO performance, and PMO influencers every year. The finalists for that award to see who will make it to the top three will be on August 31st. And then there will be an award ceremony in November where they name the winner. So last year I was top 15. Uh, Perhaps this year I make it to the finals. We'll see. Also want to mention the ASU PM Summit is coming up on September 29th. This is a virtual online conference that's free to all to participate. Arizona State University, of course, one of the leading universities in the U.S., and they've put together a fantastic schedule of speakers, including some names I'm sure you all recognize as Elizabeth Heron, Billy Mawape, Kim Wasson, and several others, of course. Uh, They've also let our nonprofit organization, VPMMA, the Veteran Project Manager Mentor Alliance, be a partner for this event. So we have a dedicated track for veterans, military veterans, and we'll have speakers uh, from the ASU Pat Tillman Veterans Center, uh, the director of Arlington National Cemetery, and a few others will be speaking specifically for veterans in their careers outside of the military as they pursue project management. Certainly want to thank our sponsors. Uh, They help make these shows possible, the PMO Squad and the PMO Leader. Please be sure everyone to go out and visit their websites to learn more about what they provide for their clients and their community. And also visit projectmanagementofficehours.com to see a list of our upcoming episodes, listen to all of our prior episodes, and learn more about our amazing guests who we've had on over the years. I think we're now over 30 million plays and downloads, which is incredible. So thank you to all of you for helping to make that possible. Now, for today's special guest, I am excited to have us joining from Vietnam, Karsten Lay. Karsten, welcome. And uh, if you could take a moment just to say hello to the audience and introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you very much, Joe. This is Karsten Lay, originally from Germany since 10 years in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. Originally in in Germany, I worked for the banking industry. And then also as a project coordinator. So my first real job was a project coordinator in Citibank Germany. Yeah, like like a junior project manager or like a project manager helper, if you can say so. Yeah, um, to get into that. And I really love the cross-functional vibe about project management. That's first what attracted me. And after Citibank, I worked four years for Deloitte Consulting. So you see a lot of American companies in my CV, by the way. During the time, I had different jobs there, change management, consultant, supporting training, SAP. And the the last year, I really had a great project where they named me Global PMO for a Deloitte and Touche tax investigation project, which was not my expertise. But we were, we as consultant were the global PMOs to really organize the show. So we didn't do the work. But we organized the 200 consultants on this project on 
invoices, timesheet, making sure they they had places to stay, they could get around the world. They yeah, I mean that's also that's the first time I really got in touch with PMO, right? Uh, project management office on a very practical stage, right? Where you say this was a project to really organize 200 consultants and make their life easier, that they can fully focus on their work. And that was the, back in Munich, also with a lot of colleagues around the world. And that was my first real um, touch with PMO. And also where I, sponsored by Deloitte, I had the chance to do the PMP at that time, which was very nice. Yeah, PMI, PMB methodology inside Deloitte, of course. And then from there, after four years consulting, I left to Vietnam. I mean, I wonder, I also had a time after my studies being in Mexico for a while, not so career related. But then I wanted to go to another country, which is not so cold like Germany. So I, I looked to Southeast Asia and also booming region, I have to say, from a from an economic point of view. And in Vietnam, the first job I got, I was a PMO, a project manager in a banking PMO for a Czech financial service bank, who are very huge in Eastern Europe and in Asia. And yeah, that was that was very nice and challenging because... In the PMO, every project manager had to run four to five projects at the same time. So that was the benchmark. That was the KPI. Yeah, And of course, it was you are coordinating in the morning a sales project to, uh, to get, to get um, a sales tool for 5,000 front-end sales. In the afternoon, you were coordinating a, a fit-out project to build a new office. It was a very new and enriching experience for me. And then at the same time, I was doing a turnover reduction project for HR. And Mm. don't ask me if I was an expert on all of that. Of course, I was not. But I think uh, uh, one thing maybe, Joe, you would agree, as a project manager, it's very good if you're very open-minded, curious, and very very cross-functional thinking, right? And maybe you are a person like me who could not stay for, let's say, five years on the same job. I want to have new input, new topics, yeah? And so I worked three years for this bank. And one topic which came along at that time very strong was the topic customer experience, yeah? Mm -hmm. And after I did for a year the customer experience project, they asked me if I want to be customer experience manager. And I said, ooh, yeah, let's try it. Why not? And what is amazing, and I will speak about that later, customer experience is very PMO related. Customer experience is an initiative or strategy in a company where you have to constantly push, control, and sponsor projects for your customers cross-functionally. So inside CX, and later I did it also for one of the biggest e-commerce here in Southeast Asia, I had my own PMO running. I mean, customer experience has also research and other units, right? But even inside customer experience, which is an initiative over all the departments in a company or or the entire customer journey, you run your own mini PMO inside. Yeah. Yeah. So, and there I realized, and after after the e-commerce, we started our own consulting, Asia PMO, um, and there we realized how enriching it was the experience to have as a foundation project management knowledge and PMO knowledge. Because any other topic you want to do or consult or help other companies, like transformational topics, like digitalization topics, it always comes down to project management, yeah? Or even to organize PMOs on your side or together with the client side. So I think... Also, for a lot of people who always ask me, project management career, and I said, yeah, but it's, it's a foundation. If you start as a project manager, you can almost go everywhere, right? And this is how, maybe a little bit long intro, and I apologize for that. Yeah, <laughs> This is how from, from banking via Deloitte, via being internal PMO, via CX, we come now to Asia PMO, our own consulting company. And we are so grateful to have this PMO knowledge as a really base foundation for everything we do. Yeah, lots of great information in there. We're going to dig into some of that. Uh, the first thing that jumps out to me, right, is as you're telling your story, um, you start in Germany, you're working for some American companies, you spend time in Mexico, and you end up in Vietnam. One, that goes to show the global 
reach and familiarity of project management and PMOs, because it really spans the globe, but two, how open you were to take risks and to take a challenge and to go explore to see what was out there, right? So often we get comfortable just sitting in our job for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and we don't go explore to see what's available. So what was it inside you that said, hey, I think I'm going to go explore. I'm going to go learn to see what's out there and not just stay here in Germany for the rest of my life. I mean, from an upbringing point of view, and my and maybe a lot of my Americans can also relate to that, I'm from a very rural, uh, small town environment. I mean, that growing up in small town and not in maybe also like probably more like in the middle of the US, like I somewhere in the middle of nowhere in Germany, make gives you already can give you already a drive to explore right that was one the other thing is after my high school i know i didn't directly study i studied later around my time with mexico so because my family is is working class and there was no scope to study in and there was no money to studying so i did what was the best in my area i did a banking apprenticeship it means a german system where, where you learn a job but you get paid at the same time. You don't have to, um, it's not as costly as studies, right? And in these four years, I, I mean, I was happy, right? I mean, I had a stable job. I had a little bit of better situation than my family at that time already, but it was very monotone, yeah? Mm -hmm. And because I didn't have study at that time, they limited me to say, oh, you cannot go higher and you cannot go further and you cannot go to big city branches or anything like that. And that bucked me. That really, really backed me, right? So I, I was then the type like, I show you, right? <laughs> Maybe, you know, I mean, when people don't look at your abilities, they look more at your certificates and your upcoming maybe, yeah, or your, your background. Um, so I said, okay, I leave the bank. My parents were deadly scared. They were like, are you crazy? I mean, we brought you up to have a job after high school and you, you throw it all away and go studying. Yeah, in Germany first, but I did it on my own risk, right? That was the first step. And then I realized during the studies, I mean, the more educational measures or the more training you take on, yeah, the more chances are opening and the more you go out, the more chances are opening, right? And this is a, this is a, this is a little bit the journey. And then going to countries like Mexico and Vietnam was maybe also to get a little bit out of the cultural the cultural part of germany which sometimes is also not that open you know in because i mean project management is perfect in germany i mean it's a perfect topic for germany i don't say it's perfect in germany but we are very organized culture yeah similar like that japanese we are a functional culture right i mean you don't have to teach people to come on time on on meetings things like that and people follow up and people know what to do but what I, what i was missing was more the other side this more agile flexible management part which is still sometimes a little bit lacking in germany which let's let's say it's it's which from a management school point of view is probably pretty big in the US. And that's why you have a Silicon Valley. We don't have a Silicon Valley because that comes from, from a mentality, right? And I, I was actually looking for that. And now that with 43, uh, me and my partner, we did our own consulting company. Sometimes I'm very, I'm very sad that I could not have been that with 23. Right, They're one of these crazy Silicon Valley guys who, who is then rich with thirty, and but a train. But with between twenty and thirty, I really had to get myself up on the education path and open my mindset. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't come to me like the nowadays the generation. Yeah. So, and I think so. My answer is where you come from. You probably want more. Yeah. Yeah, if you're if you are a little bit limited, or if people limit you, and the other thing is maybe it's a very internal curiosity, I mean, a curiosity which drives you always to say, I need to know more. I have to go out. I even even the curiosity makes you feel that you really don't take risk because the feeling of curiosity overshadows the thinking about oh, shall I do it or not? I don't know if that makes sense. And, and I think. Is certainly, we can't generalize for all project managers, but yeah. project managers are leaders, right? We're always leading initiatives and teams. 
Mm. And, and I think leaders have that inherent curiosity and that inherent, I want to do better within us, right? That's what separates mm. project managers maybe who are born to be PMs versus those who've been trained to be PMs, uh, mm. right? Uh, so, so I think hey, we have a lot in common, uh, I, I think, on our journeys. And certainly I, I'm not in the middle of Vietnam or, or didn't travel to Mexico for my education as well. But uh, I sought out more than what I had from what I was born into, right? I, I, mm. And I think that's, for those of us that are just born PMs, I could completely relate to you on that. The one thing that that I think that I put, trying to put myself into your shoes, right? And as you go to these uh, different countries, the language had to be a barrier, right? How do you, um, uh, yeah, obviously in Mexico, they're not speaking German. Uh, mm -hmm. In Vietnam, they're, they're not speaking Spanish. I mean, what, how do you handle the language uh, mm -hmm. challenges within these different moves in different countries? Yeah, I, think, I think that's probably my biggest challenge because also when I look back to my high school years, my weakest subjects were language. Yeah? Even German language itself was a weak subject. I was never good in writing. I mean, now that I do blogging, it's still very tough for me. Essay writing, blogging, yeah, it's not really something I enjoy but it's necessary nowadays, yeah. So language skills, I was more on the mathematical, historical part of the, of the school side, yeah. English, because I went to the UK for exchange study, right? I mean, that's, that's how I did it. You go there, you learn the language. I'm not the textbook learner. I'm also not the management type of guy who, who works 10, 12 hours and then reads super, super, interest, uh, super uh, smart books all the time. At the moment, I read a lot of doc books and I play my PlayStation if I have time because I need that. And I know some people would say, ooh, but maybe it's still because I was working class before. I mean, my whole, my whole childhood, we watched TV for relaxing, right? I mean, there were no smart books around. So, and, and I, 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 I'm not, I'm not unproud of that. I don't want to be this smart guy 24-7. Uh, I don't have to be that, right? Um, if I want to relax with a, with a stupid movie, I want to relax with a stupid movie. And if others read books in that time, that's their problem. That's not my problem, honestly. Learning languages was easier when you go into the countries and you are forced to learn the languages in the country. Now in a country, I mean, Spanish, three years Mexico, I learned it there. Because, and the other thing I try not to do is to go into this trap that you go to a country and then you hang out with your own people. In Mexico, I was very strict on that. Even some Germans I met, they were a little bit angry because I was like, I don't want to hang out with you. I know enough Germans from home. I want to now hang out with Mexicans and Americans and people I never met before. Right. I mean, yeah. maybe very extreme. And some be, maybe now I look back and partly it was also stupid, but it helped on the language side. Because I didn't get into the trap that I moved to another country like I would see the other people. And then I speak my own language most of the time because my surrounding are people from my country or my cultural background. So that's a little bit the side. Honestly speaking on Vietnamese, I'm in 40, 50 percent. And the reason is because in Ho Chi Minh City, the business language is mainly English in international companies. So and also... Vietnamese, they tend more speaking English to you to learn English rather than Mexicans. They are like, this is Mexico. I'm sorry to say that, but sometimes they don't like English or whatever is connected to English, right? Uh, for some reasons. And they are like, you are here in our country, you speak Spanish, right? I mean, they are much stronger on that and prouder. Now, in Asian cultures, people are very polite and much more polite. So they want to make you feel better as a guest. So the weakness here for me, and it's my weakness, even I'm married and I try to speak Vietnamese with my parents-in-law and everything, but not being exposed to that on a 24-7 basis makes me not to learn the language so strong like I learned English or Spanish before. So I hope one day, I always tell my wife, one day you have to lock me four weeks in a village in Vietnam and after four weeks, you pick me up. And in this village is nobody who speaks English. That's how I would learn it. Yeah. Well, and again, I, I applaud you for the courage to go just jump into the culture, right? And learn that way. That's, I think, that takes a lot of strength, right? To be able to do that. And, and again, I, I really applaud that. So 
you're in Vietnam, but how did you pick Vietnam, right? There's many countries in Southeast Asia that you could have chosen. Certainly Korea, South Korea, right, with a very strong economy and Vietnam, maybe not as well known as a business community. What brought you to Vietnam? I mean, it, I did what a lot of people do. I was, I was in Deloitte Consulting for years. And in a company like Deloitte, you can take a sabbatical. So you can take four to six months off without losing your job, right? And I did the same. And I did the typical Hanoi to Bali backpack tour through Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, Malaysia, Indonesia. I mean, all the countries, right? Yeah. And during that time, I tried to make connections. And I also started to apply. And I also started to get a little bit feeling. I mean, one of the reasons of this backpack tour was also to feel a little bit, where do you want to stay, right? I mean, just to, to hang a little bit around in these places, yeah? Yeah, and then by chance, honestly, I mean, I would, I would love to give you a story that I deliberately picked Vietnam, but I didn't. So by chance, I got the first job in Vietnam, yeah? Okay. Maybe, well, they, maybe they choose me, I didn't choose them. <laughs> Sometimes that's how fate works out for us, right? Yes. You put yourself in a position to be found, um, yes. and then you were found. Yeah. Um, so now that you've been there for a while, mm-hmm. and, and you've gotten to experience uh, the business environment there, we, we had talked you know, prior to the show several months back to get to know each other a little bit, and you had shared that you were kind of surprised how strong the business economy is starting to grow within Vietnam and in the way that it's it's increasing there. What have you found to be the, the business environment? Vietnam was very surprising to me because economically it's not on the map for Americans or Europeans, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So first I found out Vietnam is a country of almost 100 million people. So similar size to Mexico, right? It's bigger than Germany in people, has the same land mass than Germany. So even Vietnam looks smaller because it's very thin and long. It's exactly the same size on a landmass like Germany. So I always tell tell my whole people at home, if Vietnam would be in Europe, it would be the biggest European country, yeah, mm-hmm. which is very surprising. Vietnam is yeah. bigger than the UK, France, Spain, yeah. So it's it should not be underestimated. The other thing is, Vietnam has two very strong hubs, which is Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon which like in Thailand, you have mainly Bangkok, right? In Indonesia, so they have two very strong hubs. Yeah. One is a little bit more old industry, which is Hanoi and government related. And Saigon is more like the startup scene where we are, right? And the digital and technology scene. Yeah. And the surrounding of, so Saigon here. So this, this, this makes it very strong. And now if you look at a map of Southeast Asia, Ho Chi Minh City is in the center. I mean, where I live, I have a two hours flight to Singapore. I have a two hours flight to Malaysia. I have a one hours flight to Thailand. And on the other side, I have a two, three hours flight to Hong Kong and to Philippines. So I'm in Singapore also two hours. And so I'm perfectly located between all these strong regions or stronger ones, perfectly in the center. Yeah. And then you have a country who has to catch up. I mean, 100 million people have to catch up with a, with an average economic growth in the last 10 years of 5 to 6%. Yeah. Mm. And that's a lot of catching up. And then, of course, there is a middle class growing now. Yeah. Even in rural areas. I mean, the trend that they, that they move all to the city is going a little bit down because the, the tier two, tier three cities are coming. Yeah. Strongly here in Vietnam. So, what I appreciate, which is similar than Germany, there's a little bit more distribution than just to say now we all have to go to the capital. I mean, Germany, we don't have this trend. We have very small, big cities, right? I mean, Frankfurt, half a million. Everybody's laughing about that, right? But it appears a big city. But Frankfurt is a half a million uh, city uh, where I worked before. So Vietnam has also that, that part. And then, of course, the Vietnamese mindset here, right? I mean, Vietnam is a, is a socialist country which makes it also very stable. I mean, I'm, we don't have to go now in politics if socialist is good or bad. But if you look at so-called democracy, democratic, democratic countries like Thailand, where you had a military coup, Myanmar, where you had a military coup, Philippines, 
where you have a madman maybe running the show. Even he is president, he is um, elected as a, as um, democratically. So not changing the government, I mean, similar like in China, makes the business environment pretty stable and the currency and everything, right? And yeah. also visa laws, everything you need as a foreigner makes it very, very stable. Yeah. Plus, I'm, I'm, I'm in between Singapore and Hong Kong. And of course, for some reasons, you would also register uh, your business in Singapore and Hong Kong beside of Vietnam, right? To have a little bit more access to international trade. And this is perfect. This is totally easy here, right? So there are a lot of advantages um, having Vietnam as a, as a very stable socialist country with a very stable growth where everything is pretty planned, honestly, right? Not so many surprises. And then you have this, this 100 million, very hungry, very ambitious people. And we know from the history, Vietnamese are people, they can make something out of nothing. They have this mentality here. I mean, Vietnam is not perfect, right? Vietnam is not like everything is perfect. No, but the people here have the spirit. They don't give up, right? They run a business, it goes down, they run another business. They try one thing, it doesn't work, they try another thing. Maybe because they also have to, but it's the mentality of the country. In Germany, when you lose one time your business, you will never ever try again because we have a failed mentality in Germany on that. You're like, ooh, you're a loser. You tried it one time. In Vietnam, nobody cares. You try, you fail, you try again. Yeah. And I admire that here. I really admire that here. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that, it's amazing to learn different cultures and different kind of the, just the way com countries take on their own personality and what they offer. And heck, I, I an, never would have guessed that Vietnam was bigger than Germany or, or the European countries, right? You just don't, you just don't picture that in your brain, how big a country it is. So that that's the journey of the global travels, right? Of Karsten Lay and getting to learn how you got to where you, you are now and, and the challenges you faced and the benefits of being in Vietnam. But while you're there, you you started a company, right? Mm -hmm. Again, having the courage to not just stay as a project manager, but to be able to elevate yourself and take that chance, like you mentioned with Vietnam, the kind of the company, the country culture to go try and, and create something. So Asia PMO, how how did you start that? What was the impetus for you to be able to branch out on your own and start your own company? I mean... It was not a, a zero to 100 start. I mean, even during my, my start in Vietnam or even before with Deloitte Germany, I always tried to have some side jobs in the weekend as a trainer, right? Even in Mexico, I tried a little bit leadership training, but I maybe was too young and not very credible on that. And then later with, with my background in Deloitte, it was easier. And also with the PMP certification, I got into PMP training. So I did it a long time beside a job. So some institutes hired me on the weekend as a, as a freelancer to do PMP training, sometimes also a little bit project management training and consulting. But because I had like five days a week other jobs and then also in manager and VPs positions, I didn't have much time and dedication for that. Yeah. And it took a while for me to say, okay, you get out of this, I get my paycheck every month and you don't have to worry about anything. But what really drove me out a little bit about that, so it was really the desire I want to do my own thing. But on the other hand, it was another thing which you see a lot in entrepreneurs if they are very honest. It was being tired in political power environments. And it's, it was being tired to not to do your own stuff and always depend on your superiors or on decisions in the company or decisions you cannot influence. Yeah. And that was one, one of the biggest drives where I sat then after, after my last job in the, in the e-commerce one, where I was VP customer experience, also did a lot of project where I said, okay, not applying for a job anymore. I have savings. We already had at that time here and there some smaller clients and trainings running, right? And let, let's go full power in. And what is amazing, the moment you go full power in, things happen. Because before, when you do it only on a Saturday, Sunday, and you say, oh, I have to come over a certain threshold, you will not reach that threshold because you don't go full power in. So it's a little bit of chicken and egg game, right? 
it's good if you i would i would never tell anybody to say quit your job tomorrow and then think about a business idea no if you can do it like us try it two three years on the site build it small up try your competencies right especially when you want to do training coaching and consulting you can always do a little bit on the weekend but you will never come to a full-fledged consulting business yeah until you go full in because you need the time to do that yeah and since since then i mean we do a lot of cross between i mean we do mainly consulting, but the consulting implies training because our topic like project management, OKRs, customer experience needs to be explained sometimes. So we, we train, but we are not a training company per se that we just go training, training. We really try to consult, bring value, build projects and teams inside the companies. And then we also branched out in more topics, in speaking gigs, you know, like on stage speaking. Now, um, of course, um, um, all, a lot of international um, conferences online, right? But that things comes I and mean, it came along. Yeah. Also, maybe because driven out of mine and my partner's curiosity, right? That we say, oh, let's try it. Yeah. Or let's try to ask. I mean, that's how we also met because I saw it on LinkedIn and I asked you. Yeah, I have, yeah. I have, I have, I have, I have Germans around me also in Vietnam. They have the mindset, and that's the problem in Germany. They they always know what will happen, and that's why they won't do it. I mean, as a German in Vietnam, asking an American radio show if you be on, what is the chance? Zero point zero nothing percent, right? If you think about logically, yeah, right. Honestly, I mean, if you think with a logic German mind, you would say, why should I bother and try? But luckily, I don't think like that anymore. Yeah, <laughs> that's what, that's what maybe the biggest leap which I which I took out of my own culture, right? Because I do, and then I think sometimes. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm glad that you have that new mindset because uh, yeah. I think it's great for for us. Even though we're we're certainly based in the United States, we've had guests from around the world mm -hmm. uh, because it's it's the same thing. Me changing kind of the traditional American mindset is we're very America focused. Mm -hmm. And we think that we have the best process, the best companies, the best tools. And even if we did, that doesn't mean we can't get better and learn from those who are outside the States and their experiences. So we, you know, we've had guests from certainly from Europe and Israel and Africa and, and now Vietnam, and hopefully we'll continue that trend as well. So for us, I think the important thing for me and our audience, again, is hearing the, the deeper meaning to what you're saying, right? It's you had the courage to be able to go do that. You had the fortitude to be able to go forward and make those sorts of changes. Those are the things that we look forward to. And that's the things that I want to, to make sure that the audience is listening to more so than just what you did to get where you are, but what can they learn from it that can help their careers as well? So you, you mentioned uh, several of the different services that you offer through uh, Asia PMO. And one of them that jumps out to me is the OKRs. Can you dig in a little bit deeper on, on OKRs and what you provide there? Mm -hmm. And I mean, the services come also, again, like I said before, from PMO. Our first service we offered was PMO, project management trainings, and the other services build up on that, right? The OKR is, is, a, is a goal setting concept called objective and key results, which is a further development of management by objective, smart and KPIs. I mean, a lot of people probably know KPIs, key performance indicators. And the big difference is a KPI is a number which measure how good you are as an individual are doing your job. Yeah? So if you work in a factory, you have to do 100 metal parts a day. They measure the quality, the time, and that you do your 100 parts. Yeah? And after a while, you probably forget where you work because you never see the end product. Yeah? Now in OKR, we have two parts. We have an objective for you or for your team, which is linked to the company. So take SpaceX. SpaceX has the objective to go to Mars. Yeah, That's the big Elon Musk thing. Go yeah. to Mars, right? Now... We think in an OKR environment, everybody who works in SpaceX, even as a janitor, 
would say, I do my job because we bring people to the Mars. And that's what you want to achieve. The people still think about the objective. So even this person has the key result or KPI to clean five rooms in an hour. But why is this person to clean five rooms an hour? Because there are people who work in these rooms who bring other people to the Mars. And that's the inspiring part about OKRs. The second part about OKRs is also that we only do it on a quarterly basis, which gets us into the agile thinking and into the agile world, yeah? Which, I mean, they're also agile PMO uh, concepts, yeah? It yeah. means similar than Sprint and Scrum, a three-month OKR cycle is very result-oriented. And the next three months OKR cycle is planned on the outcome of the previous three months. Not like in a KPI thinking where you follow one year waterfall, a very rigid plan and try to achieve it. Yeah. In an OKR environment, we malt, we, we, we micro plan only for three months, the objective and key results on company and team levels. And then we execute inside the three months and then based on the outcome of the three months we plan the next three months and these these are the powerful concepts about okr yeah that you that you have a, a faster or a more flexible uh, planning cycle in this very volatile world nowadays yeah and that you try to inspire your people with objectives rather than just with numerical measurements yeah yeah yeah, I think that's very powerful, right? I, I know, for instance, within our company, the PMO squad, we always work with our clients to talk about outcomes over audits, right? The yes. KPI is more audit-driven mindset of did you accomplish the the step that you were trying to do and you you record your performance to hit that. But the outcome, right, the result produces value. And we have to be focused as consulting firms to help our organizations that we support achieve value, right? They're paying our services to help them perform better. So I, I really appreciate and, and like the OKR mindset over the KPI mindset. Not to say KPIs don't provide some, some good to an organization, uh, but they just have different, almost at different levels, right? The way that they're utilized. You also talk about uh, customer and employee experience, right? And, and how that's connected into PMOs and and how we do things. And that one, I'm, I'm interested because that's not maybe the most common link for a PMO consulting firm. So how do you tie in that customer engagement employee experience component into the PMO? Yeah, actually, we, we stumbled over that because one of my projects in, in the bank in Vietnam was customer experience and to build up customer experience, right, with the help of the headquarter in Vietnam. And we were, I was probably one of the very earliest CX professionals in Vietnam eight years ago. That's why then the e-commerce hired me because they found me, right, as a, as a professional on LinkedIn. And for me, customer experience is a love child, I have to say. I don't know if that's the correct English, yeah, but it's some, something where I'm very passionate about, yeah? yeah? Because, I mean, PMO is a methodology. Now, customer experience is something where you do actively something for customers, right? And I mean, honestly, I, I'm really convinced that the essence of a business is customer. The essence of a business is not the money and the essence of a business are not the shareholders or the market share. It should be the customer, yeah? And when I see companies even building their OKR and they'll say, this is, this is how much we want to gain, this is how much we want to give the shareholder, this is how much we save. We always challenge them and say, what are you doing the next three months for your customers? Yeah, so it also fits to OKR, actually. Also, employee experience. What are you doing the next three months for your team? That's the employee experience objective. And then in order to run OKR and experience management, you need actions or projects or mini projects, yeah? So what we see in the PMO world, and I, 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 I was building that app for a bank in Vietnam, you can be in a very strict mindset and said, we build a PMO and the PMO only runs projects in the company and it has to be a big project. It has to be important stuff. Now for this bank, we were also running cross-departmental action management and even cross-departmental idea management. So the PMO was in charge as an idea box 
You know what I mean? As a yeah. So we collected all the ideas from people. And because it was not a scary HR or it was not a scary CEO box, it was PMO. Nice people. Yeah. You go there and says, I have an idea. And then PMO made sure that the ideas were fairly evaluated and fairly treated without any political reasons. Yeah. And then there was a fair contest and say, yeah, we choose these three ideas. You get money, you get budget, we do the ideas. Yeah. And the same on customer experience, because in customer experience, the output is that you find something which is very annoying for a customer. Yeah. I had today a case uh, with, with a bank where I'm a client and they cannot find the letter I sent to them because it's overseas. Yeah. And they are even not looking for it. And then it's between the branch and it's between the customer service and it's between the back office. Yeah. Somewhere it's lost. But as a customer, I don't care. But internally, when you want to fix that, it's a project between three areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a cross departmental project, very typical for PAO. That means a customer experience department should have inside like a mini PMO. That's the only way how you can really get results which help the customer. And a lot of results which help customer go over two or three departments. Because you maybe know that from your own experience. When you order something somewhere, it, where is it? Is it between warehouse? Is it between third-party provider? Is it between the order management system, right? And these people start to blame each other. And that doesn't help you as a customer. So... Topics like OKR, customer experience, need PMOs. Because PMOs for us is the unit in the company who is neutral, who is helpful, and who is powerful under the CEO to run cross-departmental initiatives and projects. As you talk through that, it makes me think of how are PMOs perceived differently in different parts of the world? And, and you had mentioned you have uh, before the, I think it was before the show, you mentioned you have a, a client here in California. So uh, PMO is in an American company. Do you feel or see any difference from PMOs in Southeast Asian companies? Because certainly here in America, I think not all PMOs are up at that executive level, right? They're often they're buried within a department, maybe inside the IT department. Um, and, or if they're at a construction company, uh, certainly that's different as well. But do you see any differences between PMOs and how they function and how they operate across countries and regions? I haven't seen it so much across country. I have seen it more on industries, honestly. So if you have a little bit more, let's say, traditional industries so like banking, finance, yeah, they tend a little bit more to have powerful CEO-driven PMOs. Now, in, st in startup companies, and it was our client in California, they even don't have any PMO, yeah, because they, 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 they work in agile world with product owners, yeah, but nobody coordinates them. So I see this as actually as a weakness. Even in an agile world, you should think about, uh, and then the only PMO, and I had that in the e-commerce I worked in, in, in Vietnam, the one who really was trying to hold all project and initiative together was the CEO, which is insane. I mean, the CEO is not a PMO, right? That's a completely wrong thinking. But we see that a lot. So they don't want to build these layers. So we didn't have so much problem that it was buried. The only thing where we saw which was buried a lot is the CX department. Right? When, I, when we were customer experience, they buried it inside marketing or they buried it under sales. And it doesn't work if it's not CEO related because you have to work over the complete customer journey. So we had more problems on that, on customer experience that it was buried. On PMO, the more modern a company is, I think the more hesitant to, to use PMO, the more traditional it is, they understand better the concept of PMO and invest in that. That's, that's our experience. You're, I think you said you've been out, you've been in Vietnam for now about eight years or so. So coming up on a decade, what if, what's the evolution like been for you? Are, are, are you seeing any new trends uh, in Southeast Asia and Vietnam that uh, would be of interest to, to us in America, right? This is the, the other part I love about our show being more global is 
it helps us pay attention to areas that maybe we hadn't done before. So what I mean, have you noticed? Mm -hmm. I mean, two topics, first from a project management perspective and second from economical perspective. Yeah, On a project management perspective, when I came to Vietnam and I had my first job and I got it because I'm PMP. So eight, 10 years ago, they were looking for PMPs because there were not many in Vietnam. Mm. Now, I think in Vietnam, the, the Vietnamese PMPs, they went up from the last, the last eight years from around 200 to around four to 5,000. Yeah. So plus others who work in project management without PMP, of course. Right. So there's a very, so you don't need to hire any foreigner ma anymore as a project manager in Vietnam. And that's also gone. Yeah. I would not get these jobs anymore, honestly. And it should not. I mean, a local is always better because you have the language, right. And you can coordinate suppliers and everything. I mean, there's no question around that. So it's a good trend for Vietnam that in these, in these um, capabilities, the locals are rising yeah, a lot. Yeah? That's one trend we, we see. Yeah? The second trend we see economically, what we call now a China plus one strategy. Yeah? I mean, for some reasons, companies want to move out of China, also because China is getting more expensive. I mean, they are developing very fast. Now, Vietnam having a border to China in the South and having also similar capabilities, not in size, but in manufacturing electronics and so on, yeah, has now the trend that more, some companies move out of China into Vietnam. Yeah? And what I would like to mention there also is that the Vietnamese mindset for me, what was, it was very, very impressive because sometimes we have the feeling I hope I can say that, that the more Southern the country is, the more uh, or the less we have maybe a discipline or a very dedicated working environment. Yeah. Um, but in Vietnam, it's not the case. I mean, we, in Vietnam, people are very, very hardworking and very dedicated working. Yeah. That's how they drive the country. So that was also something for me that nobody is lying here in the sun and enjoying the beach only, right? Um, which you sometimes imagine. I mean, sorry, maybe there's a very Western arrogance, which I which I mention now, but I know a lot of people with this kind of mindset, right? They say, Ooh, in our countries, we work hard, but in the rest of the world, not. And that's suddenly not the, not the case in Vietnam. And Vietnam is also one of the countries with the highest FDI, foreign direct investment rates in the world at the moment. Because people see this change both because you, you have a huge workforce, 100 million people, you have a very dedicated workforce, and you also grow a stronger internal market. If you here come for production of your products, not only to sell them overseas, but to also grow them as a brand inside of Vietnam. Similar maybe than China 15, 20 years ago, if you want a comparison. Yeah. yeah? Yeah. I want to go back to, to something else that you had, you had mentioned. You, you always had your side hustle, right? You always had uh, a side job that you were doing on the weekends or, or after hours. When you were doing that, did you have a plan that one day you were going to start your own company? Or did that come afterwards, right? Did you, you know, as project managers, we like to plan and we like to work towards execution of that plan. But we also have to have a flexibility built into us to know when to adjust. So with your career, how did Asia PMO come about? Was it always the plan to be able to have your own company? Or was it when you reached that tipping point, as you mentioned, right? I'm tired of hearing from my bosses and I want to go do this on my own. So how did that play out for you? I mean... The first two, three years, it was probably the side hustle was more because I was bored with my Monday to Friday job. Or it was okay. not, a, it, not say bored, I liked the job and I was busy, but it was not enough for me. Let's say it like that. Also yeah. probably at that time I didn't have a family, I was not married and everything. So I still had plenty of time with a 40, 50 hours job, right? And it didn't really fully satisfy me. That's where the first side hustle came from. And also it gives you some extra cash. Yeah, let's be very honest on that. <laughs> and, and then you realize, oh, that can go somewhere, right? After a while. But there's, there's, a, there's a very thin line when you, especially when you want to go to coaching consulting. I mean, you need names in your CV to go coaching and consulting. 
I mean, when I tried that uh, during and after my studies in Mexico with 26, 27, it didn't lead me anywhere, right? It was way too early because I, I didn't have Citibank, Deloitte, Alibaba, Lazada, uh, e-commerce, whatever I have in my CV, which is, which is an unbelievably door opener. I don't say you only have to do get big companies in your CV, but you need, need at least one big company if, if you can, and then you need some maybe startup or whatever success stories. But nobody hires anybody in a consulting or training field without credible experience. So you have to reach a tipping point where you say, when I was in, in Lazada, Alibaba on a VP level, yeah, I even deliberately told myself, I don't want to go on a CEO level that's on a C level because I saw the politics and I saw a lot of things which I didn't like on that level, right? And even on a VP level, I found myself so away from result achievement. I mean, VP CX, customer experience, I had my own PMO lead. I had my own project manager. I had my own data analyst. And sometimes I wanted to get my hands dirty, but I couldn't because they all did the job. Right. There was not, I mean, I was more clear. I, I'm a leader and I coach people and I empower people. But sometimes you have the feeling, hey, give me this analysis, give me this project. I want to do it myself. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and now I can do that. I mean, now in consulting, also with my consulting colleagues, I work on all levels. Right. I'm not always the, the executive consulting. Sometimes I also do some project coordination for some clients, whatever. It's up to me now. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the, the, the message I'd love on that for our listeners, right, is that same for me. I didn't think early in my career I was going to have my own company. But when the opportunity arises, you take all of your experiences and lead them to what your new path is and be open, be willing to explore that new path, but make sure you prepared yourself to be able to go in a different direction. And there's so many people uh, that send me comments and, and emails of, how did you do this? How did you do that? Um, and it's not always you have a plan to go do that. Sometimes it, it comes in your direction, but you utilize all the experiences you've had to help you be successful with it. And, and, and what I, what I would ahead. like to add is you also meet people on the way and you form partnerships on the way. I mean, a lot of things you don't do alone. I mean, I know there are a lot of people who always tell you this self-made story, but it's not true. I don't believe self-made stories. There are always people on the way who help you, who partner up with you, even maybe just for a while, who push you in the right direction. Yeah. I found last year a very great digital collaborator where COVID happened and he pushed me like crazy in the digital direction, right? With global website building and everything we hadn't had one year ago because we were very Southeast Asia based. Yeah, I never thought I'd get a client in the US one year ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he pushed me, this this partner pushed me in this direction, right? And we partnered up. So it's it's not only self-made. You will meet a lot of people on the way. Which, which gives you, which, which give, which partner up, which help you, which you help them, whatever. And that's, that's very encouraging. And the other encouraging thing is you meet people on the way and you can decide actively that you want to stay with them. In, in companies, it's not possible. In companies, you constantly meet people, you don't want to stay with them, but they are there. Right. I'm sorry to say that, but now I can decide I want to collaborate with these people. And if I like them and they fit to us, we collaborate a long time. In companies, I had colleagues, they were there and I was like, oh, every day I don't want to see them. Right. But you cannot do anything about it. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, I mean, I, I had a similar experience. I know exactly <laughs> what you're saying. And, uh, you know, Karsten, thank you so much for being on the show today. Uh, time flies when you're having fun, and even when we're halfway uh, around the world from one another. So I want to thank you for coming on. Is there anything that we, we didn't cover maybe you wanted to share with anyone or, or what's the best way for people to get in touch with you or learn about Asia PMO? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's... As well. It's asiapmo.com or my first name, Karsten, at asiapmo.com. And the main learning is find the right point where you have enough experience. Have also a little bit money on the side. I mean, it's maybe a German thinking, but we are security driven and I still have that. And then try it. If once you do want something, something full time, magic happens. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love it. Try it. Give it a shot. Uh, well, thank you again for joining us. I certainly want to thank all of our listeners, of course, as well. Um, and also, please be sure to go out and visit projectmanagementofficehours.com. You can see all of our upcoming shows and our prior shows. Our upcoming guest list includes Americo Pinto uh, joining us from Brazil. He's the leader of the PMO Global Alliance. Tim Creasy, who is the chief operating officer for ProSci. Um, and then from Portugal, we have the lucky PMO, Marissa Silva, joining us, Ricardo Vargas, and we've got some other great guests lined up for the rest of the year as well. Reminder, the shows are recorded, although we're live right now, they are recorded, and uh, they will be out of there in the podcast world, so please be sure to subscribe to Project Management Office Hours on Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, whatever your platform of choice, it's out there. Certainly, thank you to our sponsors, the PMO Squad and the PMO Leader. That's it for now. Office hours are closed. Until next time, I'm PMO Joe, and you've been listening to Project Management Office Hours. Thanks for listening to another episode of Project Management Office Hours with PMO Joe. You're not alone in your project management journey. We're here to help you achieve your goals. Subscribe to Project Management Office Hours on your favorite podcast platform to catch all of our episodes and hear industry leaders share their story and secrets to success.